Okay. Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Ranger Casey. I work here at the Lake Superior Maritime Visitor Center. I've been here for about two and a half years now. I started as an intern when I was still going to college for my history degree. I graduated with that last year with a, mu um, a minor in anthropology and a museum studies certificate. And since working at the visitor center here, I'm very interested in shipwrecks and kind of what's happened to these over the years. So to get started here, we're gonna go over a little bit of vocab. So first to define a shipwreck, we're talking about shipwrecks as the physical and cultural remains of a vessel that has wrecked. And this can be either accidental or intentional. The bow of a vessel is the front part. And a lot of the vessels that we're kind of going to be looking at, they have the pilot house and the control room at the bow. And the stern is the back of the vessel usually where the engine rooms are. And a couple different words that we're gonna to use to define wrecks, scuttle, grounding, and scrapping. To scuttle is to intentionally sink a ship. Grounding is when a vessel gets in shallow enough water that it hits the floor of the lake. And scrapping is when a vessel is intentionally uh, deconstructed and usually recycled. So we're going to use utilize that chat function to so get it ready. Have you heard of any shipwrecks around Lake Superior? If you have, you can either type in a number or a name. The Madeira, yeah. So even further from that, have you heard of any shipwrecks around Duluth and Superior? Yeah, the Matafa and the Whaleback. So for today's presentation, we're gonna be talking about five wrecks right around here, Duluth Superior. We have the MC Neff, the Thomas Wilson, the Matafa, the USS Essex, and the Amethyst. And we're gonna get started at that first point where the MC Neff is located. So the MC Neff, oh, excuse me a moment. The MC Neff was a lumber hooker built in 1888, and she would load lumber, train rails, and other construction materials to be delivered around the area. On her final voyage, the MC Neff had unloaded its cargo and was anchored near the Wisconsin shoreline 
on the St. Louis River to the south side of the Oliver Bridge, which is this bridge right here. When she was anchored, she caught fire, burned to the waterline, and sank. And basically what that means is that everything above the water up here caught fire and was destroyed, but everything that was underwater right here was saved from the fire, and that part of it just sank to the bottom of the river. It was a total loss to the owners. And in the 1960s and 70s, divers recovered artifacts from the MC Neff, some of which can be found at museums around the Twin Ports. And down here, we have here at the visitor center, a valve from the MC Neff. And just to give you a good idea of how big it is, we have a highlighter right here for scale. So I have a quick question for you guys, if you want to get the chat function ready. Based on some of those vocab words, can you tell me how the MC Neff wrecked? Burned and sank, yeah. And before we get going too much further, does anybody have any questions about the MC Neff? If you do, you can put them in the chat box. Then the next vessel that we're going to cover is the Thomas Wilson. Oh, good question, Tom. The machinery from the Neff was um, salvaged and taken off. And that's part of how we ended up getting the valve. I guess they didn't need it elsewhere. The next one is the Thomas Wilson, probably one that you guys have heard of before. So Eric's question, the um, lumber hooker, it wouldn't move logs. It was actually cut up lumber that the crane, it's basically a crane on the Neff right here, would load kind of like pallets of lumber from shoreline and then bring them onto the deck of the Neff and then it would be transported and unloaded with that crane. Great question. We have the Thomas Wilson. The Thomas Wilson was a whaleback vessel built in Superior, Wisconsin in 1892. The whalebacks were designed by Captain Alexander McDougall to slide, to glide smoothly through the water and allow water to pass over the top of the deck easily, especially in storms. Um, but because of the rounded hull, walking and working on the deck was very difficult for the crew. So the design fell out of popularity. But for the Thomas Wilson, the Wilson was leaving the Duluth Ship Canal on a clear, calm Sunday morning in June of 1902. And it was loaded with iron ore from the Misabi Range, and she was on her way to a steel mill in Chicago. This is when disaster struck. The George G. Hadley, we can see in this photo on the upper right, was coming into Duluth as previously arranged. She was intercepted by the tug Annie L. Smith and the George Hadley was told that your orders have changed. 
you need to go to the superior entry. About the same time as standard practice, the Thomas Wilson was veering off so that the Hadley had plenty of room to go through the Duluth Canal. Um, during this time, vessels usually communicated with each other with bells and whistles, but unfortunately, the Hadley didn't communicate this change of order. And then before anybody could correct course to avoid collision, the Hadley rammed into the Thomas Wilson just a little ways in front of the pilot house at the stern leaving a huge gash in the side of the Wilson. The crew on the Wilson knew that this was a bad injury to the vessel and they all abandoned ship because they knew it was gonna go down. And the Hadley's bow was damaged as well. So once they broke free of the Wilson, the Hadley, which was taking on water, grounded itself over on Minnesota Point over here. The crew jumping from the Wilson uh, were able to swim to the Hadley. And the Hadley was only about 150 feet away. And the story goes that crew from the Hadley were throwing pretty much anything that could float to the crew members on the Wilson. The Wilson sank in about three minutes just because of so much water coming into the hold so quickly. Um, and there were nine casualties with the Wilson. You can see on this photo over here on the right, we have the south pier of the Duluth Canal and the north pier with the Hadley grounded right over here, the tug Annie L. Smith that watched all of this happen and then came back to help everybody. And you can see just the end of the stern of the Thomas Wilson here, right before it went under and disappeared. And we have another view of the Hadley on the left-hand side here. It intentionally grounded to try to save as much of the vessel as possible. Um, it's a little bit less work to try to raise part of a vessel rather than the whole thing if it went completely under. And here you can kind of see behind me that we have the Thomas Wilson exhibit here at the visitor center. Um, after it wrecked, several people tried to buy it to salvage the wreck. None were successful. And then it became a popular diving spot for divers in the area, one of whom recovered several of these artifacts that we have in the display. We also have some pieces of iron ore from the Wilson when it sank. And if anybody's ever been down here to our attraction, we have a few anchors and the capstan from the Wilson out on the lawn by the shoreline. So it's, it's still very popular today. A quick question for you guys. Did vessels have speedy and reliable communication in 1902? No. Nope. Even a small mistake like signaling too late can have disastrous consequences. So do you think this wreck could have been avoided? It could have been avoided 
Um, it can depend on some conditions. But yeah, just a simple bell and whistle, letting the Thomas Wilson know that the Hadley was going to change course. Um, things could have ended up different, but it is also very hard to stop or turn a vessel quickly. And then one more question. Do you guys think anything like this could happen today? It's, it is possible to happen. Um, thankfully though, with advances in technology over time, like marine radios and satellite, uh, vessels are pretty good about knowing where each other are. Um, of course, there is all, always human error, but technology is at least advanced better. Yes, observation is key. Does anybody have any questions about the Thomas Wilson before we move on? Casey, I think someone asked, uh, how would a boat be raised at that time? Ooh. I am not actually sure what, um, what the technology was back then to raise vessels. I guess it would also depend on how shallow or deep the wreck would have been. If it was shallow, it would have been much easier, of course. And a question, how intact is it? Um, well, it is sitting upright in the water, but, um, oh, whoops. Um, it is somewhat in the shipping channel out there. So over the years, some other vessels that have anchored have accidentally hit it with the anchors. And um, of course, pieces and artifacts have been recovered from it. So it's not in the same condition as it was the day it sank, but it's still in pretty good condition that you can dive in it and see it very well. Okay. So now we're going to move to the Matafa. And that is also right up here at the Duluth Shipping Canal. The Matafa was a 430 foot bulk freighter built in 1899. But on November 27th, 1905, the Matafa left Duluth in the afternoon, towing the barge James Nasmith behind it. By nightfall, the pair of vessels was up around two harbors when the storm front hit them. They battled to make headway throughout the night in this storm for approximately 10 hours. And by the next morning, the captain ordered that they needed to turn back to Duluth for safe harbor. Um, around noon on the next day, November 28th, the snow began to let up and the crew could see the shoreline. Just a couple miles out of the canal, the captain signaled to the James Nasmith to drop anchor out in the lake. Uh, leaving the barge in the lake would prevent the vessels from colliding with each other in the canal, and it was just a little bit safer for the barge to stay out there. So, when the Matafa was entering the Duluth Ship Canal, um, a big wave picked up the stern of the vessel, and this rammed the bow down into the sandy lake floor. 
Another wave then spun the Matafa perpendicular and struck it against the North Pier right here, and it hit about midship. Um, between all of this, the engines were disabled and they lost steering and rudder capability. And then the wind and waves took the vessel, spun it 180 degrees, and it beached over on the north side of the North Pier, kind of going towards downtown. And that is where the vessel stayed overnight as it was battered by wind and waves here. There were several rescue attempts that day, um, throwing ropes and just trying to get a line out to anybody, but a lot of those were blown back into shore or froze. And by nightfall, um, you can see that the Matafa started to break apart in the center here with the stern settling on the lake floor. And by this time, about 10,000 Duluthians had come out to just witness this whole event. This is a big catastrophic event right here. And it said that they lined the shore with bonfires, illuminating the shoreline. Overnight, the crew in the pilot house was able to stay warm by taking a bathtub and filling it with paneling and other burnable materials to stay warm overnight. However, because the engines were dead in the stern, they didn't have a heat source and there were nine casualties in the stern. But by the next morning, the US Life Saving Service, you can see in their rowboat here, went out to the Matafa and were able to save 15 crew members from the pilot house in the bow section. And then this is where the Matafa stayed all winter, frozen in the ice. And you can see these pictures really kind of show how it was breaking apart in the middle and the stern really settling in the water. And of course, if you see something like this out in the ice in Duluth, you have to go get on it. It became a bit of a, a, a bit of an attraction over the winter for Duluthians. Um, however, it didn't stay there long. In June of 1906, only about six months later, it was raised and taken for repair. Once it was repaired, it continued to serve as um, a bulk freighter until 1946, when it was converted into a car loader, and then it delivered automobiles around the Great Lakes. And the Matafa is something that still sticks in local memory, but at the time, they made this cigar box cover dedicated to the Matafa. And it has an illustration here of the Matafa hitting the North Pier and sitting out in the water in the storm. This wreck was actually so popular that after the storm, they dedicated the name of the storm to the Matafa. So it was called the Matafa Storm of 1905. So using some of those vocab words we talked about earlier, can somebody tell me why the Matafa wrecked? Yeah, this big storm. This storm actually um, wrecked another like two dozen or so vessels across the lakes and killed more people. 
other than just the Matafa. So I see that somebody, we had a few questions in the chat. Ooh, the Matafa, um, I think that's roughly about 20 feet of water where it would have been. Um, the shoreline has, of course, changed since then. So it could vary a little bit. Casey, okay. there's another question about the, the name Matafa. Do you know where that came from? I don't, but that is a really good question. Okay. We're going to go to the USS Essex, and that's right over here. Um, towards the end of Minnesota Point near the Superior Entry. The USS Essex was a 185-foot enterpri enterprise-class steam war sloop. It was built in Boston in 1874. And what this kind of means is that although it was primarily a steam-powered vessel with an engine, it still had the capability to sail strictly by sail. And when fully rigged, it had approximately 15 sails. The Essex was designed as a clipper. It was mostly constructed for speed. And she was sent on various naval assignments across the Atlantic and Pacific, kind of filling in wherever needed with the Navy and making long voyages to places such as Singapore, the Suez Canal, the Cape of Good Hope, and the Mediterranean. Um, during this time, she was mostly used for fleet communications, um, things like small rescue missions, and she even took part in the 1890 Army of the Potomac's reunion in Portland, Maine. And this vessel was heavily equipped with eight gun ports on each side, plus some other armaments. And she sailed for the Navy for 27 years. And in these couple photos here, you can really see the bow that gave the clipper design just a fast pace through water. You can also see some of those gun ports on the sides. And if anybody notices from the previous photo, the center mast was removed in 1911, and it was installed as a flagpole at Camp Perry in Ohio. Um, so once she left, Navy Commission. She was loaned to the Naval Militia of Ohio, and she was in Toledo for 12 years, serving in the reserves and hosting summer training cruises. And that flagpole that I mentioned, um, it was installed at Camp Perry, but in 1998, fun fact, it was blown down by a tornado and destroyed, shattered. And we have some of those pieces um, in our collection at the visitor center. But while the Essex was in the Great Lakes, she was reactivated during World War I and served on the Great Lakes based in Duluth. But she occasionally went to the training center in Chicago and then she sailed around the Great Lakes for a few more years before transferring to Minnesota's Naval Reserve.
Okay, so then she got to Minnesota and she was permanently anchored in Duluth and she had wooden cabins and office space, office space built above her deck and the engine was also removed at this time. So it was used for several years like this and just kind of as extra storage space. But in 1930, she was removed from the naval lists and put up for sale. And then she was sold for $400 to be scrapped. And then while she was being scrapped, parts were saved and sent as souvenirs to former officers and enlisted men. The anchor and capstan from the Essex was sent to Toledo which was the vessel's first home on the Great Lakes. And then once they kind of got done with that, in 1931, the remains of the Essex was towed out into Lake Superior to be scuttled, and it was set on fire with 200 gallons of kerosene and oil, just an insane amount of fuel. And it was said to have burned overnight. In the 1990s, the wreckage was located off of Minnesota Point, and you can see some of the superior entry break wall in the background of this photo here. So it's, it's way, way down the point over there. Um, it was documented at this time, and then it was also added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1994. The amount of wreckage visible changes after every storm, just with some wind and wave erosion and stuff. So there's this photo from the 90s. And then there was another photo from years later where it's further out in water just showing how the sand around it had moved and the shoreline was further back now. Um, where the wreck is, eventually a uh, wind and waves, ice will destroy it. Um, but right now, people going down the point and potentially um, finding some firewood or souvenirs kind of pose the biggest threat right now. But we do have quite a few artifacts from the Essex right here, this photo, and you can maybe see it behind me if you can see my screen. We have different nails and tools from the Essex, and there again is my lovely highlighter to give you some scale. And we also have a lantern from the Essex. And trust me, both of these things are very heavy, a lot heavier than they look. So can anybody define a scuttle for me? Yeah, the intentional sinking of a vessel. Awesome. Does anybody have any questions about the Essex before we move to our last shipwreck? Casey, there is a question about what was President Abraham Lincoln's connection to the USS Essex? Oh, yes. Um, before his assassination, um, President Lincoln authorized that the Navy could build more vessels. Um, that contract wasn't awarded to um, the designer of the Essex. His name was McKay. It wasn't awarded for quite a few more years, but that was Lincoln's connection. Is he, he pretty much said, you guys have the money to build it. Okay, and then our last wreck is the amethyst. And that's 
also partially down Minnesota Point, not nearly as far as the Essex, but still a good walk. In February of 2007, there were some local residents out ice skating on Lake Superior off of Minnesota Point when they looked down through the ice and saw pieces of wreckage down there. They came to the visitor center here and spoke with Tom Holden, who was the director here at the time. And nobody really knew what wreck it was. So the Great Lakes Shipwreck Preservation Society was contacted and they came up to explore and document the wreck. But the amethyst um, was a 45 foot wooden tug built in 1868. And from the records that we have of it, it was most likely scuttled in 1888. So not very long. And then here we have some pictures of the Great Lakes Shipwreck Preservation Society divers um, diving under the ice in, in February, by the way, in Lake Superior, very, very cold. They measured, photographed, and examined the wreck. And using a bunch of that data, they went back and kind of looked through some other wrecks that didn't have locations. And they concluded that this was most likely the 45 foot tug amethyst. So in 2007, when these photos were taken, a good part of the wreck was covered in sand. Um, the waves and erosion kind of moved the lake floor around quite a bit. So if we were to go out and see it today, we might see more of it or we might see less of it. But here on the left hand side, we're looking from the stern of the vessel, you can see the propeller and we're looking towards shore in this photo. On the one on the right, we're looking at the base where the engine would have gone and that's roughly midship. And this is looking towards the stern. So out in the background of this photo would be the deeper part of the lake. Get your chat function ready. I have another question for you. We talked about another vessel that was scuttled. What was it? Yeah, the Essex. I have a critical thinking question for you guys. Why do you think vessels were scuttled in the lake and not in harbor? Do you have any ideas on that? Yeah, keep them out of the way. Keep them out of <laughs> vessel traffic. We don't want other vessels to hit them and then sink as well. Okay, does anybody have any questions about the amethyst? You see in the chat, um, Amethyst is a type of rock or gem. I am not a geologist. <laughs> okay. And so we're just kind of looking at, again, these are the five wrecks that we covered. The MC Neff which burned to the waterline and sank back by the Oliver Bridge 
up the St. Louis River. Then we had the Thomas Wilson, the Matafa, the USS Essex, and the Amethyst. So why are we talking about wrecks? Why do they matter? What do they tell us? So first we have some archeological significance. Um, these wrecks are basically time capsules, meaning that they're left untouched. We can look at like the Essex and look at the construction design of it and say, you know, this was either a really, really awesome design or this failed terribly. Um, when it does come to that significance, um, the different states and countries have different laws on shipwrecks and preservation. So for, exist for example, um, there are different shipwreck preserves where vessels are preserved um, mostly for diving and research. Canada has a lot stricter laws than the US does. And even different states kind of have different protocols on, you know, if you find a wreck, can you take anything or not? You know, how do you report it? Stuff like that. For history and archives, um, of course, that helps us tell the story of this area of the shipping industry and kind of how how do we get to where we are today? Kind of like that Thomas Wilson example. Technology got better and now there aren't as many wrecks. So we have a, a good thumbs up on that one. You can see here we have museum exhibits and displays. Objects just kind of bring those things to life, don't they? And we have interpretation like what we're doing now. And we have the cultural value of the wrecks. You know, what, what's the significance to the shipping industry as a whole or to the story of Duluth or Lake Superior? So you might be kind of wondering, how can you contribute? Well, museums are always looking for objects to add to our collections. We love collecting things. So if you do have any objects that you'd like to donate, uh, we're always open to that or the appropriate location. Um, volunteer experiences, especially during programs and events. Uh, we love to have help and um, get people involved. You can visit and support us, engage in programs and take surveys like the survey that will be at the end of this presentation. And you might kind of be wondering, what are these two crazy photos on the right? Well, that was the volunteer experience I did a year ago, and it was helping restore a lighthouse on Lake Superior. And during my time there, which was about a week, we did a lot of scraping, prepping, and painting of the catwalk at the top of the lighthouse. This is kind of what it looked like beforehand. And these are not the same rails, but you could see the paint was pretty bad. And then by the time we got done, it was looking much, much better. And then I put some sources on here for you guys, not sources, but more, more to explore. Um, in Duluth, we have the Meteor Museum, as well as the William A. Irvin. Um, you will want to check on local guidance to see what is open and what is not. The SS Meteor is the last whaleback vessel in existence. So just like the Thomas Wilson, but this is the only one that is now above ground. The US Brig Niagara, is a sailing training vessel similar to what the USS Essex was used for. And then if you're very interested in shipwrecks, there is the Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum on Whitefish Point, and you can look at the Great Lakes Shipwreck Preservation Society. And then about a year ago, the Michigan DNR released 
an interactive map of shipwrecks on Lake Michigan waters. And so here's that link there. If you guys want to take a screenshot or a photo with your phone, um, it is a very cool interactive map. And then if you're going to be around the Twin Ports at all, we have the boat schedule right at the bottom here. I see we have a couple questions in the chat. Let's do the questions in a minute. Um, I just wanted to point out to everyone, give us, give everyone what a or a status on what our, our respective visitor centers are doing now. Uh, at both the Lake Superior Maritime Visitor Center in Duluth and the Sulax Visitor Center in Sault Ste. Marie, we're both providing outdoor interpretation. So while our buildings are still closed, uh, we have staff outside at both locations to answer questions and provide uh, information about vessel schedules and um, tourist information. Our location in Duluth also has a cell phone tour that you can uh, participate in. There's currently five stops, but we're adding about seven more. So, uh, so you can learn a little bit about the different attractions down here in Canal Park. Uh, the Sioux Locks Visitor Center was installed uh, there inside exhibits outside in their park. So you, you can, as you're exploring the park there, you can check out what, what you would normally see inside. Uh, and we don't have any set dates yet for our opening, for opening our visitor centers, but we will do so when state and local um, guidance, when we can comply with their guidance and health conditions permit. And then, One more slide here. Okay, so again, next week we're gonna talk about winter work at the Sioux Locks. Ranger Michelle from Sioux Locks in Sault Ste. Marie is gonna tell us what happens in the winter at the Sioux Locks, all the maintenance and projects that they do. That will be next Thursday, July 9th at 12.30 p.m. Eastern or 11.30 a.m. Central. And on the right, there are a number of links that you can learn more about what our visitor centers do and what the Detroit District, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers and Detroit District does, as well as uh, our web pages. And the district has a YouTube channel where all of the recorded videos or recorded programs can be found. So if you missed or are interested in seeing some of our past programs, they are all located on the Detroit District YouTube channel. We also have a, an email list if you're interested in getting email updates about our programming and other information. You can send a message to hello lsmvc at gmail.com. And then we've also got this uh, survey that we'd like to ask everyone to take if you have time. It's about uh, probably less than five minutes long, and it'll just give us a little bit of um, more data and uh, help us in planning our future programs. So I'm going to put this link on the chat here, and uh, then we can start doing our final questions. So someone wants to know, Casey, what is your favorite wreck as far as the stories go? Ooh, um, strictly of these five wrecks that we talked about, I think my favorite is the Essex. It's just a really interesting story that the Essex traveled all over the world and then somehow ended up wrecked right here in Duluth. Okay. And then how many total lost shipwrecks in Lake Superior and who owns them? Ooh, total is kind of unknown. We're always finding shipwrecks. There were two found just last year, um, but hundreds at least. 
um, who owns them, um, that really depends. Um, some have been bought privately, like the Wilson, to try to be salvaged. Um, eventually, those people kind of give up sometimes. Otherwise, the state or national park uh, system, like around Isle Royale, they own those shipwrecks. Um, otherwise, states, countries. Okay, and kind of related to that, uh, is it illegal for divers to remove artifacts from shipwrecks? Ooh, so for the most part, yes, but it will depend on where the shipwreck is. Um, if it's in U.S. or Canadian waters, um, who owns it? That all kind of depends on each wreck. But it's just not a good practice. Okay. Uh, what shipwreck artifacts are on display in Canal Park? Ooh. Right here in Canal Park, um, outside, we have anchors and the capstan from the Thomas Wilson. Um, I don't think there's anything else from a wreck outside, but inside behind me, we have the Thomas Wilson exhibit, and we also have the Fitzgerald exhibit. Um, that being said, we do have quite a few shipwreck artifacts in our collection. And is the area around Duluth a federal underwater sanctuary? Not to my knowledge, no. All right, I don't see any more questions coming in. Uh, thank you, Ranger Casey, for providing that program. And uh, thank you everyone for participating today. Uh, watch our social media pages for the recorded program if you'd like to check that out or visit the USACE Detroit District YouTube channel to check out some of our past presentations as well. Uh, again, thank you for participating today and uh, I hope you all have a good holiday weekend and stay safe. Thanks everyone.